Lord God, thank you so much for Easter. Help us, Lord, to understand how to respond to you and to your resurrection after Easter morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We celebrated Easter last Sunday, and what an awesome celebration. Holy Week was incredible here, one of my favorites. And today, we're going to begin the six-week season of Easter. Easter is actually a season of the church year. And the question for us this season is how to respond to the resurrection. What would be your response after seeing Christ come back from the dead? Would you freeze and stare at Jesus? Would you jump into his arms? Would you say, "Uh uh-oh, that must have been the response of the Pharisees and the religious leaders who plotted to murder him. Uh Uh-oh, he's back. Christ certainly wouldn't gloat about his achievement, but if he looked at them, he could easily say, nice try, I'm back. But that wouldn't be in his good character to take revenge. I can only imagine what they were thinking during those 40 days when Christ walked around Galilee, throughout Jerusalem, and the surrounding area. What would be your reaction? We're going to learn how the first eyewitnesses responded. Today, specifically, Mary Magdalene. Her response is a pattern for us to follow today. And I'll share specific applications for your life. I invite you to write these down. First, a little bit about Mary Magdalene. I like to dedicate at least one Sunday to her every year. Why? Because she's one of the most remarkable, incredible, amazing, noteworthy people in all of the Bible. Absolutely without question, she was Christ's most loyal follower. It makes me think of this pamphlet I received from one of our members. Back in December, I made a pastor care visit to two members of our church, Margaret and Ruth, who live in Greenfields, Geneva just about a mile away from here. It's a retirement community, and Margaret told me that her and her friends were studying the New Testament women of the Bible, and they used this pamphlet. She handed it to me, and I briefly looked at it. She said that she had an extra copy, so she gave it to me, and I read through it, And it's the best resource I have found with the most notable details about Christ's most loyal disciples who were women. You should know these women and their connection to Christ. There's lessons to learn from all of them. The first on the front here is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Then Elizabeth, she was John the Baptist's mom. Mary Magdalene, who was healed of demon possession. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, you might remember, they confessed Christ when their brother Lazarus was dead. They had an even-if faith, one of the greatest confessions in the Bible. Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth who received the Apostle Paul's message and opened her home to the disciples. Priscilla, she and her husband started a church in their home. Our church started in someone's living room. Here's a photo of one of the first gatherings. Phoebe, a deaconess in the church who provided Paul valuable help. Dorcas, a believer in Christ who the apostle Peter raised from the dead in Acts chapter 9. Open it up and in the inside cover, there's even more. The women who met Christ during his ministry and experienced his healing power like the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. And after she touched Jesus' cloak, she was instantly healed. The forgiven woman who washed Christ's feet with her hair. The Canaanite woman who asked Christ to expel the demon from her daughter. And Christ said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. The Samaritan woman who met Jesus at the well. After Jesus told her everything about her life, she went and told the whole town, that she met the Messiah. Come, see the man who told me everything. Could this be the Christ? Inside are portraits 
of each of these women, it's a great resource. If you want to borrow it from me sometime, there are lessons to learn from all of them. Several things are special about Mary Magdalene, but most importantly, she was the first person to speak with the resurrected Lord, the first evangelist of the resurrection. She was commissioned by the risen Lord himself to go and tell the disciples the good news. Her place in history as the first eyewitness of Christ is extremely significant. One of the strongest pieces of evidence to prove Christ came back from the dead is that he appeared to hundreds of people after his resurrection. Mary was the first of many. Real historical people in real time, in real history, they saw him with their own eyes, they heard him with their own ears, eyewitnesses who touched him and felt the scars on his hands and his side. In fact, the church made it one of three criteria for an author to get their writings into the canon of the New Testament and the Bible. The content had to come from an eyewitness of the resurrection. In fact, for someone to replace Judas Iscariot, they had to have followed Jesus all the way to the resurrection. In other words, the author had to be an eyewitness or had to get their writings, their content from an eyewitness. Mark got his information from Peter. Matthew was an eyewitness himself. John was an eyewitness himself. And Luke gathered his information from an eyewitness, including Mary, the mother of Christ. So if you're wondering the other two criteria for an author to get into the Bible, the writings had to be widely circulated among the church, and the teacher had to be consistent with the teachings of the apostles. If Jesus didn't appear to people after the resurrection, it could easily be argued that it's all a legend, that it's all a fairy tale. But on several occasions, he appeared in the flesh, and amazing things happened. The same people who saw his dead body saw him alive again. It moved them from disbelief to belief. They were willing to defend the resurrection to the point of death. Eleven of the twelve disciples were brutally martyred for following the resurrected Lord and preaching his name. John lived to an old age. He wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus had one more vision to share with his people. And that's why it's at the end of our Bible. Jesus met Mary Magdalene at the tomb on Easter morning, and she thought that he was a gardener. Speaking of gardens, this week's devotion on our YouTube channel is one of my favorites. Brian and his wife Emily connect their garden and their backyard to the resurrection of Christ in a powerful way. It's great, and I invite you to watch it and to subscribe to our channel. That'll help us reach even more people for Jesus. Go to our website, lolchurch.net, click on Watch Weekly Devotion at the top, and there you can watch not only this week's devotion, but previous devotions as well. So after his visit with Mary Magdalene outside the tomb, he is a traveling man. Some of these appearances happen in Jerusalem, but not all of them. It helps put the appearances into context on a map. At least four of the appearances happened outside of Jerusalem. Here's a map of the resurrection appearances. First, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, then the women at the tomb. Then the two men on the road to Emmaus, just west of Jerusalem. Then to Simon Peter. Then he appeared to Peter and the eleven disciples behind locked doors in the upper room. And by the eighth day, he appears to doubting Thomas and the eleven Then he restores Peter at the Sea of Galilee. He appears to 500 brothers, then to his brother James. He appeared to the 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee, perhaps Mount Tabor. Then he gives the great commission to the 11 disciples and he ascends into heaven. He ascended into heaven just south of Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives. And the Apostle Paul records that Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. 
So several appearances of Jesus. And what does all of this tell us? It tells us that he's alive, that he's in good shape. My doctor told me recently that walking is one of the best exercises. Jesus did a lot of walking that Easter and the weeks after. Walking is not too strenuous on the body and it gets the joints and the blood moving good. So I go for walks most mornings. Sometimes I run, but mostly I walk. My doctor also said that seeing morning sun helps with sleep as it helps the body to have a natural clock of when to wake up and when to go to bed. Christ was busy on Easter and after Easter to prove that he was alive. He went on a tour, as you can see from the map, to multiple locations. He visited with different people, men and women. And you can believe it's true. It's not just wishful thinking. The evidence is clear. It's there. They've seen him, they've heard him, and they've touched him. And John wrote this. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. Early on Easter morning, Mary Magdalene and the women, they arrive at the tomb. There they have a deep conviction to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. They didn't finish earlier because the Sabbath started shortly after Jesus died. The Sabbath started Friday at sundown. So they rested from Friday sundown until Saturday sundown. Then they prepared their spices and they did all of this to keep the Sabbath, to honor the law of the Lord. And now that the Sabbath is over, they arrive early Sunday morning at Christ's tomb with spices. And they know that the tomb was sealed shut and that there were guards. But oh well, they love Jesus and they want to honor the body of their Lord no matter what. They're willing to risk their own lives to finish the job. And that's one of the details that gets overlooked. They were going to do whatever it takes to get inside of that tomb and bless Jesus. And they don't even know he's alive at this point. They think he's still dead. That's incredible to me. Their faith and their loyalty to Jesus. Look carefully and Mary arguably spent more time with Christ during his public ministry than any other person. Maybe Mary, the mother of Jesus, had spent as much time. But she loves her Lord. She's mentioned by name 14 times in the Gospels. And when she arrives, she sees the tombstone rolled away. And there are no guards. She starts crying. Angels appear and explain things. Something amazing happens next. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. She doesn't know it yet, but she is the very first eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. This is extremely significant. Back then, rabbis didn't disciple women, but Jesus did. Relating with a woman who had been possessed by demons was an unthinkable action by a man of God. But Jesus did. Think about this. Of all the people who God could have picked in all of history to be his first eyewitness of his resurrection, he picked a woman who was once possessed by seven demons. No Jew would have made up that story to defend the resurrection. That would be the most unlikely scenario to support the resurrection. It's more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Some think that Mary was a prostitute, but there is not an iota of genuine evidence in Scripture to suggest such a bad reputation for her. It's one of the greatest misnomers of Christianity. This was a great privilege and a great reward given to a woman whose broken life had experienced Jesus healing. God chose her by his grace, and she personally experienced his grace in a profound way. 
we'd expect Peter, John, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, to be the first eyewitness. But Christ chose his most loyal disciple to see firsthand what all history had waited for, the pivotal truth of Christianity, the victory over death, the victory of all victories. And there's a lesson here that Jesus chooses people healed by the Lord to bring his healing message to the world. If you think your past is messy, if you think it's too sketchy for Jesus, think again. Give your past to God, and he's proven it again and again that he will use it for his good. Here are some virtues of Mary for us to emulate today. In Luke chapter 8, Luke records that Jesus cast out seven demons from Mary. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So did you catch that? Mary Magdalene supported Jesus' ministry financially with her own means. And as I already mentioned, she personally experienced the power of God. She was loved much, and she loved much. She was the most loyal and faithful of his followers. She traveled around Galilee and into Judea with Jesus and the Twelve. And this is depicted well in the current series, The Chosen. I invite you to watch at least season one and the very first episode, which documents Mary's transformation. Remember early when Mary said, They have taken my Lord away. When she says my, the Greek word used there is emphasized. My Lord, my very own Lord, the one who did so much for me and the one I love to serve. She's the only disciple who can truly say that she was there at Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And she was the one who stayed at his tomb when others left. She was a leader. As I mentioned, she is recorded by name 14 times in the four Gospels. And in eight of those times, she's named in connection with other women. She always heads the list when listed with other women. And that implies that she occupied the place of leadership at the front and service rendered by godly women. The other times where she's mentioned alone, the connection is always with the death and resurrection. Of Jesus. She's the first evangelist of the resurrection, inspiring us to go tell the good news of Jesus, inspiring all people, men and women. She was bold in her telling of Jesus' resurrection. And in a moment, we'll hear about when Jesus told her to go to the disciples with the message, and she delivered it. She went and told the eleven that she had seen the Lord. They didn't believe her at first, so they went to see it for themselves. After she saw Jesus, she worshipped him. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, said Jesus. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So what's our response to the resurrected Lord? Well, we should follow Mary's example. We should worship Jesus. And when we gather together in person and online, we worship the Lord Jesus every Sunday, every week. And you are invited to worship the Lord Jesus, yes, with the body of Christ, but also on your own. There is power in worshiping him in your daily life. We should also tell people that the victory of death is won. And that the grave has been overcome. God's great love has conquered death for you and for me. And nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from the Lord and from each other. The barrier of death has been destroyed. The power of death has been overcome. You can now know God, your creator, by faith. And this is the very thing that you were created for. To love God and to know him. 
And it's a new life, not just when he returns or not just when he raises us physically from the dead. It's a new life now as we're baptized in Christ, buried with him into his death and raised to a new life, to live a holy life, to turn away from ungodliness, to turn away from sin, gossip, rebellion, and sexual immorality, and to turn toward the Lord in purity, love, holiness, and obedience, following the truth walking in the light, turning away from the darkness. See, Mary is an example of Jesus' resurrection power for today. You might be wondering why she's called Mary Magdalene. Magdalene wasn't her official last name, just like Christ wasn't Jesus' official last name. Magdalene means from Magdala, three miles southwest of Capernaum is the town of Magdala on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Here is a map. She's from Magdala, a very wealthy region during Jesus' time, but it lies in ruins today. Archaeologists are still finding treasures there. Now look what Jesus says to Mary. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? He knows why she's crying. He knows who she's looking for. She's at the tomb of Jesus, and she's looking for him. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And this is a remarkable statement of faith from Mary. It's incredible. She is willing to go and sacrifice herself if, in fact, Jesus' body has been stolen. Think about that. She is willing to confront thieves just to protect Jesus' dead body. That's love. The fact that she thinks Jesus is the gardener is one of the strongest arguments for the garden tomb in Jerusalem being the location of his resurrection, which I showed last week in my sermon. There is a garden there, and it's outside the city walls of Jerusalem, just as Scripture describes. Scripture tells us that Jesus was crucified near the city, but outside the city walls. Then Mary has this aha moment. She knows it's him. Listen to what Jesus says to her, and her eyes are open to recognize him. Jesus said to her, Mary. He knows her by name, and she realizes it's him by the way he says her voice. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus was her rabbi. He knows her by name, and the way he said her name was so recognizable. This wasn't the gardener. This was Jesus, her Lord. When someone says your name, your first name, and you don't expect it, it's surprising, right? It makes you stop and think. Like when I meet someone at church, and I hear their name for the first time and the next week I remember it and I say it back to them, I often get a, wow, you remembered my name. Well, he said her name only as Jesus can say it. And she knows the tone of his voice. She knows the love in his language. Jesus knows her and he knows your name. In fact, your name is written in the book of life along with everyone who is in the family of God. Here is a fascinating pattern when Christ says someone's first name. It usually indicates that he's sending the person to do something important. When God baptized you, he called you to do something important, to go and declare the wonders of God, to go and to proclaim his name. And he sends you with a baptismal calling to go and tell the good news. Look at what Jesus said to Mary. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And this to me is a little funny because Jesus is telling her to go and make disciples of the first disciples. Those 11 men who abandoned Jesus. Go tell them. They're afraid and they're slow to believe. But Mary isn't. She acts immediately and obeys her Lord. 
She runs and tells the disciples the good news. Jesus' words here are very, very important. She finally has Jesus back from the dead, and she wants to clasp his feet. She wants Jesus to stay. Don't go anywhere, Jesus. You've already left once. Don't go again. But Jesus tells her not to hold on to him in an earthly manner, but to go and to follow him by faith in a heavenly manner, sharing his message, something that we all should do to hold on to Jesus by faith, to share the gospel. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Wow. Mary is an incredible woman, an incredible example for us to follow and a pattern of how to respond to Christ after his resurrection. In summary, Mary followed Christ to the cross, to his empty grave, and proclaimed his name. Let's go do the same. Amen.
our God And oh, we'll see how great How great is our God Greetings, Lord of Life. My name is Tim Christopher, and I'm one of the seven elders here at Lord of Life. My wife, Chris, and I have been attending Lord of Life for 29 years. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for today's message. Let us bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. We have so many things to be thankful for. Lord, thank you for the Easter season. Because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we can spend eternity with you. Thank you for the amazing spring weather. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Lord, thank you for Pastor Matt and his family. Thank you for our praise band, our church staff, and all the volunteers who serve our church family. Place a hedge of protection around all of them. We ask that you bless those who are visiting today. May they feel your love and your peace. Help those families that are suffering because of the tornadoes. Comfort the families and friends who've lost loved ones to the recent mass shootings. Protect them from the evil one. Protect and strengthen our military, our police and our firefighters and all those who serve to defend our freedom to worship you. We lift up our pro-life mission partners to you. Give them the resources they need so they can save innocent lives. Father, give us hearts to love and serve each other and those who that are and those who are lost. Open our hearts to receive your love, your hope, your joy. Give us wisdom and strength so that we can be courageous in our faith in all that we do. At this time, let's take a moment of silence to reflect on individual prayers. Father, we lift up our prayers to you and look to you for answers. Protect us, Lord, fill us with your spirit and leave no room for the evil one. Thank you. Father, for answering our prayers. We love you and we praise you. Stay with us, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.